Hello everyone and welcome to week number 10. Crazy to think that we have just one short week left of this quarter. Um, this week is actually one of my favorite weeks as we get to talk about a topic that I absolutely love um, and that topic is phlebotomy. Now I don't want you to panic. I know that some of you are really not looking forward to actually doing this and performing this and being in this section. Um, but I promise you that once you actually start doing it, you will really like it in the end. So this week our focus is going to be on two chapters. Uh, those two chapters are going to be chapter 47 and 44. Um, this week for the day one video, I'm going to start off talking about chapter 47. And in the, in the day two video, that's when I'll switch over to chapter 44. <clears throat> So chapter 47 is a chapter that is focused on phlebotomy and blood collection. Now you may hear me at some point in time during the video or even in class saying phlebotomy or venipuncture. Please know that either one of those terms refer to the same thing. Uh, they're just interchangeable terms. So when we're talking about phlebotomy, this is the collection of blood through a tiny incision in the vein and this is typically done with a hollow needle. So I want to start off talking about and discussing your role as a medical assistant in this procedure. Your role will be properly collecting, labeling the specimen, possibly processing it, or storing the specimen until somebody can come pick it up to process it. Now, in order to do this, we have to have a basic understanding of a couple of things. We have to have a basic understanding of the circulatory system, the equipment used during phlebotomy, asepsis, and the venipuncture procedure. Now, if you remember several weeks ago, um, between weeks two and three, we actually talked about asepsis. So I am not going to focus on it for the video. If you need help with that, please refer back to the chapters for chapter two or for module two and module three. All right, so I want to start off this video talking about the circulatory system. In the circulatory system, it is important to understand the basics about the heart, the blood vessels, and blood itself. Now, the heart has one main job, and that whole job is to pump and keep your blood moving. If your heart stops pumping, you will not live anymore. If the blood isn't flowing, the blood isn't moving, nothing's going to happen. Now, blood vessels, on the other hand, their job is to provide a one-way travel route around our bodies and then back to the heart. There are some key players in this process, though. Um, it's not just the blood vessels that are part of it. Um, some of those key players are your arteries, your capillaries, and your veins. So arteries are what blood, <clears throat> sorry. So arteries are when your blood leaves the heart, it carries out, those arteries carry blood out from the heart. They are very thick and your arteries have an elastic wall. So what they really feel like is almost like a hard um, elastic feeling. The blood that is carried from the heart and through the arteries is bright red. So kind of like you see in the picture here, that is a pretty bright red color. That is what blood looks like in arteries. The other thing that is a, you're able to tell the difference between an artery and a vein is that arteries have a pulse. So if you are going to draw somebody's blood and you feel a pulse, you are not drawing from the right spot. Now capillaries on the other end, they act as kind of like your gas station for the blood. They are the fuel or the oxygen that is delivered from your arterial blood to the cells in your body, while the garbage or the carbon dioxide is removed from your cells and then it gets carried into veins. So the blood coming from your heart has carbon dioxide in it. 
it hits the capillaries and it picks up oxygen and it loses the, that carbon dioxide. <clears throat> and then your veins pick it up. And when the veins pick up the blood, they carry it back to the heart. But first, it will be carried through your lungs where that carbon dioxide is really breathed out. And it supplies new oxygen for us to breathe in. Veins have a thinner wall and they feel very spongy. So they're going to feel kind of like a bouncy ball. And or a trampoline, that's the best way I can describe it to you. Now, blood that is found in your veins is typically darker, and it doesn't actually get that red tint to it until it hits the air and it gets that oxygen. All right, so moving on, we're going to talk about some of our phlebotomy equipment. Now, there is a wide variety of equipment that is used for phlebotomy procedures, depending on what one you're performing. But some of the basic things that you will need are blood collection tubes, double-sided needles or double-ended needles, tourniquets, tube holders, and syringes. Now blood collection tubes are also called evacuated blood tubes and they're designed to automatically withdraw the exact amount of blood needed for testing. Each tube color has a color-coded end according to the anticoagulant or the additive found within it. These blood collection tubes can either be glass or plastic, but most of them nowadays are plastic as it is safer for not only the phlebotomist or medical assistant, but also for the patient. The double-edged or double-sided needles is a needle that has like it kind of sounds. It has a needle on both ends. The tip of one end is called the bevel. Um, we know all about this as we've been doing injections for a few weeks now. This is the end that actually cuts into the skin. And when you're drawing blood, you always want to make sure that your bevel is up towards the sky. Otherwise, it will hit the bottom of a vein and nothing will happen. The bevel, or the lumen, is the space on the inside of the needle that is, has a thickness depending on what you're performing. Now for phlebotomy, the typical gauge length or gauge width of a needle that we will be using is somewhere between 20 to 21 gauge. So it's a little bit bigger than what we've been using to do injections. Remember, the bigger the gauge, the smaller the lumen. Tourniquets are elastic bands that are used to help collect the sample. They will be placed about two to three inches above the puncture site, and they stay on for no more than one minute at a time. If they stay on any longer than one minute, they will make the sample inaccurate. The tourniquet will be placed on the arm tight enough so that it stops your venous blood flow, but still allows your artery or arterial blood flow to go on. If it cuts off your arterial blood flow, it will cut off the circulation to the patient's hand. Tube holders are plastic devices placed at the end of a double-sided needle, and that's what holds the tube in place once it's on. And lastly, you have syringes. Um, these come in all shapes and sizes, as you already know. And we use anywhere typically from a 5 milliliter to a 20 milliliter syringe based upon how much blood we need to actually draw. All right, so the venipuncture procedure itself um, is the part I really enjoy talking about. Um, it really kind of gets down to the nitty gritty here. So this procedure can be performed in several areas of your body, but the most common will be that of your antecubital space or the bend in your elbow. And there are three main veins that we use for phlebotomy. We have your median cubital, your cephalic, and your basilic. The median cubital is the most popular because it is typically the largest vein that we have and it's the most anchored in your body. It will be found in the middle of your antecubital space. Your cephalic vein is the second most common used 
but it's not as large as your median cubital. It is still pretty well anchored, and that can be found on the outer edge or the thumb side of your antecubital space. And lastly, we have the basilic vein. Now this is the one that we use the least amount for one of two reasons. One, it's not very well anchored into the body, and two, it's directly above your, your brachial artery. So if you go too far, you will hit the artery. This vein is located on the inner edge or the pinky side of your antecubital space. So now that we know where this procedure takes place, let's discuss the three different types of venipuncture. The first one is the vacuum tube method. This is also called the evacuated tube method or vacuum tube. It's the most common method because it allows multiple samples to be obtained at the same time without having to do multiple sticks. The vacuum tube is set to take the exact amount of sample that it is needed and it will stop filling once its vacuum is, has been fulfilled. Next we have the butterfly method, which is also called the winged infusion method. It is a needle that attaches to a tubing and at the end of the tubing, a syringe or a tube holder can be attached with evacuated tubes. This is what we use for smaller veins um, that are typically harder to draw on. Um, for example, we have them with children, we use them on the hands, our elderly patients, and our cancer patients. And the last type is a syringe method. Now this method is used to collect samples from small, fragile veins that cannot stand the pressure of the evacuated tube method. The drawback to this method is the same is you go back the amount of blood that you need for a tube. If you know that you need more than maybe five milliliters, you can use a different tube syringe size so you can get the appropriate amount of blood. Now when you're drawing and using any of these methods that I just talked about, it's really important that you make sure that you use the correct order of draw. The reason that we say that is because it prevents what we call cross-contamination between the tubes with skin bacteria or other additives. The correct order of draw is you first want to use a yellow or a blood culture bottle, a light blue tube, red tubes, red marble or tiger top, green, light green, lavender, pink, gray, or dark blue. And we'll talk about more of these in class, so don't worry if I go a little too fast here. We will spend a lot of time going over these in class. So the last thing that I want to talk about for this video today is the capillary puncture. This is also called a skin puncture and it is used when a very small amount of blood is needed. The appropriate sites for an adult are the middle or ring finger, or your third or fourth digit on either hand, but we prefer the non-dominant hand. When the fingers that you want to use are on the fingers, you want to use the outside fatty edges, um, kind of like you see here in this bottom picture. You never want to go right in the middle. Or you could use the earlobe for patients. When you use this procedure, you will need to use what we call a lancet device which contains a needle that will only go in a recommended amount of depth, and for adults that would be two milliliters. When you're doing this for infants, you will use the heel for them, and that can be um, only one millimeter in length. You cannot go any farther than that, you will hit their bone. Now there are two types of collection devices for capillary punctures. The first one is a capillary tube. These are designed to pull blood from the opening of the tube. They can be glass or plastic again. Typically, if you have one that is blue tipped, it means that there is no additive within that tube. And a red tipped one means that there is heparin to prevent any clotting from happening. The second kind is a microtainer tube. And these are typically just smaller versions of the evacuated tubes that we have. And they're color coded just like the evacuated tubes. All right, guys, that's all I have for today, and I will see you on day one of 
week 10. Bye, guys.